Sure. Well, we've had an unusual life because we grew up in the U.S. Foreign Service, which means that about every three years of your life, you uh, move from one place to the other, which means that you change schools. And when we say one place to the other, we mean country to country, not state to state, like some military uh, brats. We call ourselves foreign service brats. So uh, Ben and I were born in Liberia. Our parents working were pioneer foreign service officers, African-American foreign service officers. It's important to explain that. Um, and so we were born in 19, well, I was born in 1953 and Ben was born in 1955 in Monrovia, Liberia. I bring up the dates because it provides some historical context as to what was going on at that time. So Africa at the time was becoming independent, although Liberia was already independent. And the U.S. was also in the process of the civil rights movement, um, early civil rights movement. But Ben and I didn't know any of that. So the point is that we lived in, in Liberia for about four years, and then we were posted by the State Department to Tunisia uh, in 1957, and we stayed there for about three years, 1960, and then we came to the U.S., to New Jersey in 1960. Um, and then we uh, went to school there and we went to school in Washington, D.C. at Sidwell Friends in 1964. <laughs> um, so we've moved around. And so our story is not the typical story. Um, especially in the issues of desegregation and segregation and all that. We did not experience that in the beginning of our lives. We went to schools in Liberia and Tunisia where our classmates were the, the students of white U.S. Foreign Service officers <laughs> as well as um, the uh, children of diplomats from different countries, as well as the children from whatever country we were in. That was our base and before coming to the US. So I'm giving that context because it, it's a very different context. Um, so Ben, how did you feel about, I'm gonna ask you, a, um, start you with, uh, what school do you remember going to first? Um, so in the States, the first school I went to was Carteret. And uh, Carteret's in uh, New Jersey. No, but, the, but I mean, I'm that, asking you what school you went to well, that, first. That was, uh, I think it was called San Joseph in, uh, in uh, La Marsa in, uh, in Tunisia, where uh, we used to wear these blue smocks and it seemed like class went from early in the morning to really late in the afternoon, you know, when you were being a kid, right? Doing sort of kindergarten type stuff, running around there. So that that's the first memory of school and uh, having a good time, quite honestly, but severe, you know, tough teachers. I remember tough teachers. They weren't necessarily nuns, but it was tough teachers, you know, in that town. No, no, they were nuns. It was a Catholic French oh, school. Oh, okay. Well, they were not. Well, <laughs> in they, whatever, Tunisia. You know, I, they were nuns. Oh. I remember the, uh, the um, somebody hit one of them, hitting me on the hand because I did something. God knows what I did. But anyway, um, yeah, but it was a good school. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and that, I, I went to, my first school was in Liberia. Um, and it was called the demonstration school and it was um, actually a, a an agreement be, a, between the u.s and liberia and that's how that school was created um so and in our dad uh dad remember dad took a a video of a birthday party yeah like my right birthday Coke party tail. and and uh when you Cocktails, yes. 
And, and when uh, you look at who my friends were who came to my birthday party, they were white, they were uh, Liberian, they were the whole mix. Right. So um, that's, that's, our, that's how we began. So then what happened after you left, uh, after we left Carthage, um, where did you go to school? Well, well, why don't you talk about you? Where did you, you go to school then? No, why don't you talk about you coming to school in the States? Because when we move back to the States, I think that hits on this fun, the segregation craziness. Okay. Okay. Well, um, it was the end of our tour, meaning a uh, diplomat tour, and in Tunisia. And so dad and mom uh, decided that I should go to private school in New Jersey, which is where mom, mom that's mom's home state, as you know. And so, um, uh, so they asked some friends in, in, the, in the U.S., probably New York, uh, what private schools uh, would they recommend? So they recommended a particular private school in New Jersey. So dad and mom applied and I got in. And um, then when we came to the States, mom, Ben and I came to the States, dad had another year posted in uh, Tunisia. We came to the States and mom requested a meeting with the head of school. When she arrived at at the meeting, um, she said that the uh, head of school was shocked because she was black and he did not expect black people uh, uh, applying for schools from Tunisia. <laughs> so he immediately rescinded my application, my, my acceptance. I had already been accepted. He immediately uh, rescinded that and said he couldn't he couldn't accept me because I was black and the um, the board would not accept it. The parents wouldn't accept it. So he couldn't accept it. And um, so mom, you know, relayed that back to dad. There was no, no uh, email and all that. Anyway, the dad is in Tunisia, newly independent Tunisia, because I think Tunisia got, became independent in 57 or 56, well, 56. And he's in Tunisia representing US government, talking about democracy and all the values of the US. And he and mom can't get me into third grade in the US, in New Jersey. So they um, decided I that they would. Um, take them to court. So they took the Department of Education in New Jersey to court on, on my behalf and won. And that opened private schools to African Americans, period, in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> and so sort of going going back to your that, parents, just uh, kind of as a follow tell us to anything Sophia's about question. That. I'm wondering, Remember, I know you all didn't was a talk much time. to them about like, this we when were you were kids, but as you got older, did you all have discussions about, about their decision to go back to the US yeah, at this time school, and sort of what emotions they felt about that you know? going into these early and, uh, years? Part of the fun, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe I should say this, is part of the fun is that you were also, you were accepted at a school called Brookside. So you had gone there and then when I started first grade, I went to the other school, which was called Carteret School, where the lawsuit had been. So I, I started there. Maybe that was to mark mark the point, right. you know, the, that it was integrated now because they at least well, had no. Me. Well, no, what I what they what what Mom said is that um, they 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 were intent on keeping us in in the same schools because of our upbringing and because of our focus. And so she said that Brookside didn't have an opening for you at the same time that they had it for me. So I went first. And then I became the, the first African American at the school, as well as the first African American female at the school. And my my the only other female in my class was this white girl named Mary Rose. Yeah. The rest were all boys. Mm. And they were all white boys. <laughs> Yeah. What about you, Ben? 
Well, the main I don't I don't remember much at, about uh, Carteret. It's more when I moved over to Brookside uh, with with you for the second and third grade. And uh, what I remember in uh, the second grade was, you know, a lot of fights. <laughs> okay, a lot of boys fighting uh, in in. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a second grade stuff, you know, but sort of in uh, in, uh, in 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 the uh, recess type fighting and things. Um, I probably my most uh, there are two strong memories. One is uh, these two guys, these two kids, same age as me, were fighting with me, and they were, and they got in the car when my mom was picking me up, and I was kind of thinking that my mom would defend me against these two little white boys, right? But, you know, she was trying to sort of placate the whole situation. And, and at the time, I was really hurt that she wasn't defending me against these guys who were beating me up. But, you know, with time, I realized that if she made a stink, they would have most likely blamed everything on me and used that as a pretext to kick me out of the school, right? You know, that was how harsh the background uh, racial thing was. The other thing was that uh, because we lived in Tunisia, I spoke French or had French, uh, and there was actually a French teacher who was there and uh, in third grade, and she kind of made me her teacher's pet, which, you know, if you're like one of one or maybe two black kids in a class, and then there's like a teacher who's making you a teacher's pet, uh, I'm not feeling anything as, quote, black kid or something. I'm actually kind of embarrassed, but it was a nice thing. And I've wondered sometimes whether she was hearing the Americans talk about these integration going on. And so she was kind of throwing a little love at me, particularly since I spoke French and all that, sort of to kind of keep me going, you know? I don't know, but it's one thing I've wondered about over the years, you know, why she was doing that. You know, you're bringing up the fact that we both spoke French fluently. You're reminding me of the, of the fact that mom, uh, when, when, she was going through the litigation, they tested me in French. I don't know why they tested me in French, given that I'm American, obviously speaking English well. So that was one of the tricks they were push, pushing out there in terms of the litigation. But in terms of um, Brookside, I, I was a tomboy. So I bonded more with the boys in terms of, you know, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. I didn't really feel any animosity. I'm talking about third through fifth grades inclusive at Brookside School in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, this would be 19, what, 60 to 64. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so, uh, so the March on Washington had occurred in 1963. I remember uh, hearing about John, John F. Kennedy's assassination on the, on the public bus that we took from Montclair to East Orange to go to school. Um, but in any case, in my, in my, uh, in my class, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have any real issues. I mean, it wasn't new to me to be like you, it wasn't new to be around white kids. I, you know, that wasn't an anomaly. Um, it was just another country, another school. I mean, and then, right. okay, this country does it this way. I mean, it really, it, it really wasn't a big deal. Um, right. It probably was a then, big deal for those kids and their parents to be around black kids, but it wasn't a big deal yeah. for us. You know what I mean? We were just doing being right. kids, you know? Right. Uh, we're just being kids. And, but, did you ever get invited to the homes of some of the your student classmates? So there was a guy named Jeff Kindler. Actually, I've caught up with on Facebook now, 60 odd years later, whose um, uh, mom did invite me over to his house for birthday parties and just hanging out like in second grade. And, and he uh, came over to our house in East Orange, New Jersey. But, you know, I didn't know there were parties going on between the second and third graders so that, and I never got invited to him except that one with Jeff. And I appreciated it years later that, that he did that. But, you know, that was true in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, all the way up, you know, that you were, there was a, a social thing going on that you were outside of. Uh, 
but you didn't you weren't aware of it because you know you just didn't know because you never got an invitation you know what i mean well i i I don't, I, will, I don't remember being invited to anybody's house uh, when we were at Brookside. No one's, no one's house. And I didn't miss it either because I didn't really think that there was, that was happening. I, I didn't know that that was happening. So I didn't miss it, so to speak, or feel left out. But, um, you know, Yogi Berra's uh, sons were in my school. One of them was in my class. I didn't know who Yogi Berra was. <laughs> I didn't know they they would he would come pick up his kids and I and I'm like what's what's going on? Why is he so you know everybody's checking him out? I didn't know who he was. I did have I remember I had a problem in fifth grade. It was more with a teacher. Um, she was from Georgia. Um, forgot her name probably on purpose. But anyway, she was from Georgia, and um, I was excellent at spelling and um, everyone knew that by then I had two girls in my class Mary Rose and this other girl I don't remember and the, and now I had one black person male in my class who happened to be the son of the lawyer of the yeah the lawyer that our parents um, uh, hired for our case right, to fight New Jersey so any case um, so Mary Rose, so the teacher always uh, would ask Mary Rose to read the, the words for the spelling test. And this particular day, Mary Rose was uh, not, in, not in school. And so the teacher looks up and look, kind of surveys the class and looks at me and says, well, I guess I have to ask Dorothy to do that. Well, I was highly insulted because everybody knew I was excellent in spelling. And um, I didn't really see that as a, a, a racial thing because I took it as a personal thing that she just didn't like me. And also she is from Georgia and our, our dad is from Georgia. So I had no reason to think about anything about Georgia. And so anyway, so Mary Rose came back to school and it happened to be a very rainy day. So you wore galoshes and so forth. and. Um, I took it out on Mary Rose. I, I went and hid one of her galoshes in the, I don't even know, I think I threw it in the dumpster or something because I was getting back at her. And I think looking back on it as an adult, I, I realized that I was really mad at the teacher and it was really probably racism that caused the teacher to do that. Right. But I didn't know it at the time. I just took it personally. Right, so one thing so, that I just, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about that strikes me in what you're talking about is um, we used to ride the bus, okay, from where we lived in yeah. East Orange, New Jersey. We used to the take public the bus. public bus, the 23 of the 24, up Central Avenue and cross town to the 64. I'm thinking maybe in third grade I started to do that, you know, rather than parents taking us. But we did that every day, the two of us taking the public buses. Then when we got to D.C. and went to Sidwell Friends, we again took the public buses from where we lived on Upshur Street all the way down. And this is alone. This is not, I think maybe my dad went with me the first time to show me the route, you know, where I get off and all that. But after that, and so we used to take three buses in the morning to get to Sidwell Friends and three buses in the uh, after school. So, you know, all the busing stuff that got part of this, craziness of desegregation that you you heard about you know all these people protesting and you know it was like that was alien to me because i've been doing up through at least sixth grade i've been riding buses the whole time you know to get to the school so i just thought that that was such a nonsense thing particularly when we you know we got to to uh boston area with the whole boston anti-busing craziness that happened in the early 70s but uh I think it's an important thing yeah. to point out, you know. Well, I agree with the busing thing. Um, I, you know, it, it was alien because either our parents took us or the bus, we took the public buses. Um, now, when we left um, Brookside, we went to DC because the mothership, I call 
the U.S. State Department, the mothership called us <laughs> D.C., um, as foreign service officers and families. And um, that's when we uh, integrated Sidwell Friends School. Um, so what happened there was, uh, well, I think what happened is that Sidwell <laughs> found out that we sued the Jersey, we won the suit in New Jersey, and they decided, oh, okay, we'll take them. <laughs> I really think that's what happened, in addition to the fact that we were qualified. Um, but in any case, um, I integrated the Sidwell Friends as, Af as an African-American female. In the, um, I, I started in sixth grade and went to eighth grade inclusive. And um, then where did you go first? And then, then what happened? So um, I went for a year to a school, which is right near the White House, called Woodward School for Boys. And I'd like to give a shout out to the teacher who I don't remember her name, but it was actually an integrated class, a lot of black kids and white kids together. Some of them of a range of ages, you know, they were doing fourth grade for the third time, maybe among some of the, I remember these two particularly tall guys. But that teacher noticed that I was squinting and asked my parents to check my eyes and they did and lo and behold they found I was severely nearsighted and I'd probably been severely nearsighted since first grade right because I can remember this sort of weird looking trying to read something and not understand you know not being able to see it kind of feeling um and so fortunate for me you know because the ophthalmologist said you know do you let him walk out on the street with those eyes you know and so I mean, that's how bad it was you know <laughs> And so, you know, so I, I got glasses in fourth grade, but, you know, it makes you think about when you were in first, second and third grade that none of the teachers picking up on it. Right. When it was like this teacher was used to having kids of diverse yeah. backgrounds. I just want to be respectful you know, of y'all's time, too. But thank you so much for allowing us to do this. This is alien time. approach. You know, um, just we're just going to do 10 seconds see, of room you know tone. I mean? So if you could just the, you know, be silent so for 10 that seconds. That was fourth for grade. Then I went to sixth grade. Fifth grade, uh, these are a couple happy things I want to speak to if I can. One is um, at my, Sidwell. You at went, Sidwell. This you is went at to Sidwell. Fifth yeah. grade and sixth grade at Sidwell. So you, you, everybody's listening. You got to understand that we're all like the one or two blacks in classes up to 30, 40, 50 people all the way through. In fact, it, all the way through my whole work thing. Okay, this is the whole path through. Is, so anyway, but it said, well, there was Mrs. Levin, who was my uh, fifth grade teacher. Uh, so it was a Quaker school. Um, but I remember her as being really supportive. And you got to understand, Sidwell only integrated after Brown in 1954. And the Sidwell approach was one black a year coming in in kindergarten. That was how they were going to integrate. That was it. That was how slow they were going to go at it. That was the strategy, but it, it kind of blew and up I think, on I, I, Yeah. I think you need to add the fact that um, Sidwell is a Quaker school. So the whole abolition uh, history of Quakers uh, is part of this mix. But go ahead, Ben. So, so, uh, so again, you know, going from the school I was at, uh, which was kind of maybe... Uh, Woodward School for Boys was not a really maybe great school, okay, to a Sidwell Friends, which is like top of the heap, right, in terms of school. Um, the thing that I, I remember uh, mostly was that uh, Miss Levin, the teacher, was incredibly, she treated me like everybody else. So in a way, it's like incredibly good. You know, you're just a kid in there being encouraged. Um, there were some things that were a little strange, like the whole Quaker thing. I was raised Episcopalian, right? And so, um, but I, I had friends as a guy, I went to the 50th reunion. I haven't seen these guys in 56 years. I just saw some of them like two weeks ago. And, you know, there they were. John Pyburn was this guy I thought was a great guy back then. He's still a great guy, you know, uh, but the, 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 that was, that was good. I think probably the happiest moment, and I'm not sure if it was fifth grade or sixth grade, was I was a really good student. I mean, um, and uh, there was a, uh, the sixth grade teacher was a guy named Mr. Barger 
first male teacher. Wow. You know, that's a whole thing in itself for a little boy. Um, but two things about him. One is that he rotated in the classroom who was going to be class president for a couple of weeks. So I got to be class president for a couple of weeks in that year. And, you know, you think about these little white kids never having seen a black kid. And then all of a sudden he's president of the class for a couple of weeks. I said, Mr. Bark is really smart as I look back on it, sort of in uh, socializing those kids. The other thing was there was a spelling bee and I was a really good speller and I was picked to be in the spelling bee in sixth grade. So, you know, this was up at the senior high school, big gym, all the parents and all that. And we're all upstage and there's, I don't know, 10 of us and they're putting us through the spelling bee. And, you know, I'm, I'm the only black kid up there, right? Uh, as I look back on it. And for me, you know, I didn't win, right? I, I don't know, but I wasn't the first one off, you know, so I felt bad about it as a kid. I hadn't made it, but I thought about it afterward. That must have been a shock to a lot of those white folks out there seeing this black kid up on the stage. You know what I mean? I mean, and in my family, it was just, you know, I was like, gosh, gee was sorry I didn't make it, you know, and it's like, don't worry, that's cool, you know, because they didn't lay a trip on us of like, you're the black kid who's supposed to do the thing. No. It was just no. be yourself, be yourself, do, do your best, that kind of thing is yeah. important, you know. But I can think that in the yeah. room, Dad. you know, in the room, that would be a huge thing for the people to just see a black kid being up at the front. Because I know that a lot of white people have been told all their lives that black people are stupid and lazy and yada, 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 yada. You know, and then all of a sudden, here's a kid who's up in the front. And it's like, deal with it. You know what I mean? Deal with it. Yeah. But then the other thing is that mom and dad never talked to us about being black. Yeah. <laughs> They didn't label us. We didn't know we were black until other people said, oh, you're black. Like I remember uh, people would use the term, oh, she's red or she's yellow. And I would look at them like, I don't, you know, I'm looking for yellow, the color yellow. <laughs> and and I don't, I, I can't understand why are people calling, labeling people yellow or red? I mean, the terms I, were very strange to me and very odd to me. And and mom and dad, I asked them later on why they didn't let us know that, first of all, that they had this, this litigation. And second of all, why didn't they explain this whole racial thing? And they said they didn't want us to know because they wanted us to explain, wanted us to live limitless <laughs> without having race and, and gender as a limit. Um, because that's not how we were we were raised prior to coming to the U.S. So all of this is happening in the U in the U.S. It's not happening outside of the U.S. And and that to me was a, a great advantage going forward because essentially we were fearless and we just saw things as they were. And plus, we were being educated in the same way as the upper class, I call it, or the leadership of any country, really, any country was being being um, educated. The sky was the limit. And that's how they brought us up. The sky is the limit. So anyway, I wanted to to um, just add in terms of uh, you were talking about how the, the, the teachers treated you at um, Sidwell and this and the kids. I shouldn't call them kids. Right. We were all students. Anyway. Yeah. How was um, it for you? How um, was it for you, Dorothy? Oh, that first day. Well, Sid, well, I didn't have any, I didn't have any, you know, it was just another school. Okay. Okay. I'm going to another school. I didn't know the prestige quote of Sid. Well, I still didn't know it by the time I left. And then also my friends, I had friends. I had Ellen Wise and I had Buffy Rhodes and we were buddies. We were tight. And it was more about the it girls versus the non it girls, which is kind of normal in any setting. Uh, I, I wasn't in, invited by to the homes of most. Maybe what I should say is I was invited to Ellie's home and she lived in Bethesda. At the time, Bethesda was an all white neighborhood and upper, upper class. And I didn't know any of that. I was just going to go visit my friend Ellen. And then Ellen, her parents allowed her to come, I, looking back on it, allowed her to come to our house, which was in in Northwest DC. And that, that I guess was an oddity, but, um, you know, it, it, it didn't phase me. So 
I think we should move on, Ben, and talk about um, going from uh, Sidwell to Collège du Léman in Versoix, Switzerland. Um, so dad got posted to Nigeria in 1967. Nigeria broke into a Biafran war in 19, no, dad got posted in 66. Nigeria broke into a Biafran war in 67. State Department wouldn't allow us to go as dependents, but they would pay the educational allowance. So they opened the door saying, you can send your kids to wherever school you want to go to. And he picked Switzerland. <laughs> and so, right. And so one of the reasons they said he picked it was because we had a family friend who had her son there, who was, he was American and Liberian. And also we had a great uncle on our mom's side who worked for the UN. So we went to Switzerland. So how different was that, Ben? So, you know, this was boarding school, right? So uh, we were, in, you know, living in the boys, living in the boys dorm. Um, and so, uh, and it was a, a, a mix of English, American and French sections too. And the kids were coming from all over the world. So it was really, you, you know, we've been talking up to now kind of about the Americano-American trip, but now you're in a situation where there's so many different types of cultures together among all these kids at the school. And a lot of the... And yeah. it's, it's a, I think you need to add that it was a Swiss-owned school. It wasn't right. American-owned. Yes. Okay, fair enough. A Swiss-owned school. And, you know, most of the teachers were English, which means that their whole trip on race was a different kind of thing from the American trip if there was a thing on race and gender for that matter. Um, but um, so the the fun thing for me there was that seventh and ninth grade, the hormones kick in like we all do and we used to have dances and going down in this room called the picnic room and they had these dances, you know, I just loved to dance and I was popular and things, you know, it was fun, you know, just, I think I had my first kisses and all that stuff in that wonderful, amazing eighth or ninth grade kind of thing uh, that we all have. And, you know, teachers, uh, there's Mr. Raggett, uh, who uh, pushed me to kind of do a play in ninth grade. There was Mr. Gale, who uh, accepted me in eighth grade to do algebra in ninth grade, uh, ninth grade algebra while I was in eighth grade. And so those are kind of things that really are key as I look back on it towards accelerating my career afterwards. So, uh, and the other part was that we traveled, the school had these trips around Europe, even to the Soviet Union that we did at, at the time. So, you know, you're like 13, 14 years old, wandering around Leningrad or as it was, now it's St. Petersburg or Moscow or Kiev, you know, uh, seeing the site. Or seeing or Lenin's, Lenin's too. School, you know, and all that. And, uh, I, one of the things that really struck me was, you know, I assumed communists had horns, right? You know, from everything I'd heard here. And I, we were in uh, Warsaw, and there was a picture of the starving Biafran kids from, Ni you know, the Nigerian Civil War. And it looked like it was like, you know, please give donations for these starving. And it, it blew my mind that these folks in Poland would care about these kids in Nigeria. You know, it was like a link between these two parts of myself, you know? Well well, uh, also, I want to say, uh, in Switzerland at the time, there weren't a lot of black no, people no. in Switzerland. Fair enough. Uh, they were, and if they were black, right. they were Africans. <laughs> and so I remember walking down the street in Geneva, uh, because they would allow us to go, uh, you know, just go shopping for the Saturday afternoon and just get back to the school by X time. They were like, gave us all kinds of freedom in that sense. And I would go up to an African male or female and, and because I'm shocked to see them and say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And that was it. Fast forward, I've gone to Switzerland and there's a ton of blacks uh, of all persuasions in right. Switzerland. But um, Switzerland opened my mind to global because up, up to then I know Africa and I know the US. I don't know global. And so at that point, it was, it was, um, it was uh, it, it was eye opening, but from there Ben went to Phillips Exeter 
and I came back for the last year of uh, high school to Mary Lawn of the Oranges, which is a all girls Catholic school in South Orange, New Jersey. And Ben, what, hap what happened when you went to Phillips Exeter? What was different? So I, I went there in 10th grade. It was uh, 40 day girls, 840 boys, again, a boarding school. So I've been in boarding school since I was like 11, right? So uh, I was Joe Popular in uh, Switzerland and there were no girls at the uh, at Phillips Exeter. So I went to one of the local dances at the churches, you know, that they told that's how you could meet some. So I walked up and I asked 12 girls to dance and they all said no, these little white girls, all of them said no. And I went back to the dorm like, what's wrong? I've lost, I got no game anymore. What happened, you know? And, uh, but one of the seniors was really nice. He said, you know, I would have stopped at three. So respect, you know? It kind of made me feel a little better that I'd actually tried, you know. But uh, there, there was a guy, Mr. Thomas, who was the dorm parent who really saved our life. Uh, he was uh, really good at keeping us going uh, and keeping us going forward. And, and again, this whole thing about having been going to school with kids who are white or other nations all along, it was really more about the trip on those those kids seeing a black kid doing this stuff that was there. I mean, I just recently had went to a 50th reunion and a guy told me that one of the things that struck him, he's from Pascagoula, Mississippi, white guy, was that all the myths he'd heard as a kid about black people were, you know, he realized they were both, they were myths, they were myths when he hung out with me in that dorm at what? the time, you know, back in the day in 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Well, you know so... Well, when I was at Mary Lawn, uh, I had a, um, a uh, it was a, like I said, a French, not French, a Catholic uh, school. And Angela Davis was, un they discovered her underground. I don't know, even know how to say that because I didn't understand why would she be underground? I knew nothing about Angela Davis, but because my last name was Davis, this particular nun came up to me. I hope you're not related to Angela Davis. And I said, well, I don't think so, but I'll ask. So I asked our dad and he said, well, actually we might be because we came from the same plantation in Alabama, which I was like, okay, well, I used that as ammunition when I went back to school and went straight to that gun and said, oh, you know, we might be. And she freaked out. And then the other thing is, she, cause I was like, why are you comparing me to somebody I don't even know? But she piqued my interest in Angela Davis, but so I started looking into her and what I really liked about Angela Davis was that she was a fighter, number one. And number two, she had actually gone to, she had actually gone to school in Switzerland, in, in Europe. And, and that was the first African-American female that I had met who had gone to school anywhere close to what I had been going through. And, and so she became my heroine in so many ways. Meanwhile, the, the nun is saying, don't go to Brandeis, don't apply for Brandeis. And I said, I, so I did apply to Brandeis with no intention of going, but just to mess with this teacher right. because I thought it was outrageous that she would do that. And so, so it was things like that. And then also they had a, um, a male teacher in this Catholic school and we had this assignment. He says, you can write about anything, whatever project. And I decided to, to, to do a questionnaire on sex education, on, on premarital sex. I didn't know anything about Catholics and, and their issues with that. And so I did. I wrote the whole thing up. I gave it to my classmates. And in two weeks, he called me in and he says, you have to stop this survey. I said, why? He says, because the parents are calling the Head, the, the head of the school and they want you to stop. I'm like, okay, whatever. Because in Switzerland, we would talk about premarital sex. And, you know, I mean, I, it's like, you know, what am I supposed to do? So then he comes back, he says, all right, well, what do you, you know, what grade do you think you, you want? I said, I get A plus, not my problem that you stopped my survey. And he gave me the A plus. Okay, so there's a lot of like nu nuances that, um, I, I think we're running out of some kind of time, but the thing is that that's, that's all of those experiences led us to being in Boston 
for uh, at the time of desegregation. And Ben was at Harvard and I was at Boston U and witnessing the issues around busing, again, busing, uh, was 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 terrifying. I, it was just terrifying. Didn't you feel that well, way, Ben? I went to this bar, okay, if, like after I was 18, because it had great dances, music, and you could dance there when I was like a freshman. And this was right when the busing thing, man, I got beat up in the bar. You know what I mean? I was like, whoa, that was maybe sophomore year. So I was like, okay, by the way, I didn't know it, but it's called The Other Side. Any people from Boston would remember. But this was a gay bar. I didn't even know what it was as a bar. You know, I just thought it was, but they, you know, they had drag queens and all that stuff. And it was hilarious. It was great. You know, it was fun. But, you know, but somebody just thought I asked the wrong girl to dance. And then, boom, I was in a fight. So I was like, okay, so much for that. So that was like, you know, the the feeling. Um, one thing I just want to say to you that was really got to me years later when some of the children of that time wrote about it, is that there's a whole thing about the Irish Americans that um, uh, about you know when the uh, how the Irish became white sort of thing that there was a whole history of Irish trying to become accepted you know like no Irish need apply all that stuff right in the Boston area you know it's like I used to say the Brahmins used to play the Italians off against the Irish against the blacks, right? Well, none of that was talked about during busing. None of it was mentioned at the time. Yeah. It was like 25 to 30 years later, there's like this unstated stuff going on in the white community that you find out about because somebody sort of breaks the omerta, right? And so that's one of the things that struck me uh, afterward was that, you know, why was this kind of craziness happening? Well, it's tied to some very heavy history that was happening in several different th ways in the white community itself, you know, as well as the anti-black part, which was kind of heavy, but no one in the white community would actually articulate it at the time. Isn't that heavy? I mean, it's like a trip that whites are playing on themselves. Well, it was really deep. I. I, 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 I just want to say that at BU, a lot of my friends were maced. They were worried about getting raped. Um, I remember the man, the Haitian man being attacked with the right. flag on city, oh, yeah. city Hall. That was scary. And BU is right on the street. I mean, that's Commonwealth Avenue. So that, that you, you don't have any place to hide, so to speak. There's no real campus in that sense. And I had a, a really racist professor who uh, flunked me and basically kicked me out of school because he said I didn't uh, put in my, my final paper on time when I actually handed in the paper at the same time as my white friend. And it took a whole semester to fight the school and the, and the professor to get him to change that so that I could be reinstated into uh, right. school. So. Boston, I, I I hated Boston. I'm trying to start liking it, but it left a searing mark in my head. I when I talk about Boston U and Boston, I say that I, I the things I learned there were racism and sexism. Yeah. And that and then I went on to Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and then I learned racism, sexism, and classism. All of this I never experienced prior to being in the yeah, US. Right. You know. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, you know, I, my thing is that uh, really happy to have had a excellent education. I wish that every kid could have had the education, and every kid in America could have the education that I had. That we spent the money to make sure every kid had that kind of an education, because I think the the kind of amazing things that could come out of all those kids doing, you know, being allowed to go their full potential would be would would be great um and i you know i just want to say that there are a lot of trips i mean i worked in overseas and all that stuff i've dealt with lots of different types of how do i describe it white people you know european white people as opposed to an, an african white people as opposed to american white people or canadian white people you know and you know it, you, you you i recognize that there's just like this American trip, you know, and it's a trip in their heads. It's not a trip in mine. Okay. I mean, there are parts of it that I have right. to deal with, you know, 
but all those trips and and you know, there's other layers to this. There's the Asian thing. There's the the Latin thing, and all that too, right? But all I'm just trying to say is that a lot of times I'm just looking at people who are acting weird, and I'm like, man, what's wrong with you? You know, I know something's wrong with you because right. your stuff is abnormal as compared to just other random white people I've yeah. known all along the way. You know. And and also, I think our upbringing has taught us to treat people the way they are. I mean, they could be terrible people as people, <laughs> not because of their race or or whatever gender or whatever they have. And and also, we're not really um, it, it, we we're brought up with people, thought leaders, and leaders around the world, and so we know that they put on their pants the same way we do. We're not enamored by their title. That's another part of this experience. And I, I, I think that education, good, excellent education is a right. It's a human right. And I get mad that it has to be disintegrated in the same way that, for instance, DeSantis is doing in Florida at the moment is, is outrageous because all of us lose by not having the proper education and the best education. Yeah, it's insane. Have. It's so insane. Ben, the I, stuff I, I just want to let really... you all know, in case you're wondering what insanity looks like, this is insanity with regard to that stuff. I'm just going to say it like that. Yeah, banning books. I mean, how do you learn? Anyway, so Ben, it's been great talking to you about this part of our lives. And um, and we go from here. We continue. La luta continua. La luta. <laughs> all right. Okay. All good things. All right. They never said anything. It, you know, it's really like, okay, you go here. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, okay, whatever school it is, it doesn't really matter because by then we had been in four schools. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's not, they, they didn't say, they never said to me at that time you were rescinded because then that would have probably caused right. a question. Like, well, why was I rescinded? Because I've never been rescinded before, right? And, and and I'm an excellent student. So I'm sure they just said, okay, well, we're not we're not gonna talk about that. Right. To so, her. You know, and it really we 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 didn't we just kind of bumped into the fact that this happened, meaning mom happened to say something, you know, like way later on in life. And also when I was going through my dad's um files when he died, I was going through his stuff, and there was the whole file right there all the legal documents all the correspondence and then that filled in the blanks also so one thing sophie i just wanted to maybe add in is when we moved from jersey to dc i distinctly remember they're sort of looking at different schools for us to go to and i can remember i have this memory of sort of this interaction between my parents and a principal a white principal and my parents where the kind of talking down to thing was going on by the principal towards my parents that I felt was kind of weird, you know? And, you know, in the racial dynamics, I can understand it. This wasn't Sidwell, it was some other school. What, but, uh, you know, the, so I had some inkling of things, right? You know, that were a little, what you know, because you know, these are your parents, so you're like, they're gods, right? You know, and then this guy is kind of disdainful in the way he's talking to him. And, you know, it's like, it sits in your mind a little, there's another thing I, I, I didn't talk about that I wanted to speak to, so I will now. Uh, so when I was about nine years old in New Jersey, I was playing with the car on my grandmother's rug in, her, in their bedroom, right? And the TV's on in the background, the old black and white TV. And uh, I hear this voice in a Southern accent say, and we shall overcome, you know? And I thought it was one of those civil rights guys, right? Okay. But what it was, it was President Lyndon Johnson in March, 1965, making a 
speech to Congress to introduce the Voting Rights Act. And I can still remember being shocked as a nine-year-old to hear the President of the United States say, we shall overcome. It was like a amazingly hopeful. I mean, it's like, I felt like he was talking to me, you know what I mean? In a way that I can't explain, and even to this day, it just sticks with me, of sort of like, even the president is on my side. You know, and I, I think about that whenever I see these different presidential people. What are those ninth grade, those nine-year-olds out there when they hear this president speaking? What do they feel? You know, when they see DeSantis doing his routine or all this, you know, what is that ninth grade kid playing with their, that, sorry, that nine-year-old kid hearing about, the, or these transgender kids, you know, kids who are questioning themselves about, you know, what are they thinking? What are they feeling like? Because I distinctly remember that emotion of like, it was kind of like, a, you know, a hopeful thing, you know, in a, in a way I can't really, it still gives me goosebumps to talk about it, you know, because it was so, you know, it was, I, I, I thought it was like going to be, you know, Martin Luther King or Ralph Abernathy, one of those guys when I looked up and it's the president of the United States basically saying, I'm on your side, man. I was like, "Wow!" But it stayed with me. I and I I wanted to add a, a something in terms of the schools. I um, after the litigation, I distinctly remember be, uh, being interviewed at two schools. I didn't remember being interviewed at Brookside. I I remember um, going to a school called the Kimberly school which required um uniforms and i i was absolutely not gonna go and have a uniform and so my mom took me and she said you better do well on this test and i knew i was going to flunk it on purpose because i didn't want to wear a uniform and so i did but i flunked it and she was so mad at me because she knew i did it on purpose and then the other one was the beard school and she told me later that she was she was worried because I kept telling the head of school what to do yeah. with his school. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that's the level of confidence we had because why wouldn't we have it, right? And so anyway, I ended up, they picked Brookside. I don't know why they picked Brookside. I don't really remember interviewing with Brookside, but clearly we did. So that's, that's the background in terms of those schools. And Sidwell, we had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> That was, you're going to Sidwell. And the only reason why Ben went to Woodward first is because Sidwell didn't have a spot right. open at the same time as me. Uh, so maybe uh, I can just add something about high school. So um, at Exeter, you know, talk to the college advisor, the college advisor is like, well, I don't think you should apply to Harvard, you know, maybe apply. I mean, nice schools, Wesley, and these are all great schools, but and but I did okay anyway, and I don't I know exactly. I think probably encouraged by my parents too. And so the, this thing about college advisors at high schools telling yeah. people yeah. that they shouldn't apply to this or that school, you know, that's been something that I've been fighting against kind of all my life. I tell I see these high school kids, and I yeah. say, go apply to Harvard, you know, and they're all like, oh, I don't know, you know. I'm like, no, go ahead. Because what happens is that a lot of high school uh, college advisors can't imagine for themselves going to a really great school, right? And so they don't think of that being possible for maybe this kid who, for some reason or another, might be able to get into that into that school. And uh, you know, and then you're a black kid trying to get into a school where the white uh, advisor is, it, it, you know, it's like, who right. are you? <laughs> if I can't get into the school, then why the hell do you think right. you can? You know what I mean? So you, you come across that bias. I came across right. and that I, too. And I, I just think about that all, across, and I'm not saying anything against the college advisors at all these different schools out there in America, right? But what I'm saying is that the kids need to understand that, you know, a lot of times the advisor can only imagine what was possible for themselves. And so they're giving the best advice they can give right but it may not be the right advice for that kid you know in terms of and that's where you know the family support and all that stuff might have the kids see 
see broader than what the college advisor could do. And and that can flip too, because some black families won't allow their child to go to, let's say, the best school for them because they they don't they they, they don't want them to leave the neighborhood right. <laughs> or things That's like that. Or you know they, they 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 cut themselves off because they they are thinking from the the racial boundaries that they grew up right. in or the economic boundaries that they grew up in as opposed to allowing that child to go forward to break another barrier you know because that child yeah. can't and you know I I would say on both sides they the of our family my mother's side and father's side they were kind of adventurous okay so they were like pushing us. I'll, I'll stop with that, oh, yeah. you know, just. Yeah, education was, you got to yeah. go. <laughs> you have a choice. If I die tomorrow, you still have yeah. to go. <laughs> so... They, they they had no choice it, you know you go it's a foreign service so you know like i said it's a mothership they di dictate where you go how long you stay there blah 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 so dad and mom or the whole family had been gone from 54 52 they joined in 52 so 52 to 61 so now it's time to come back to the states and go to the state department work from the state department so that's that's when that happened. And then they decided the State Department is like, okay, you're born in Nigeria. So then he goes to Nigeria. I mean, we have no control over any of that. We right. just go. But, I, you know, um, I mean, so the dad, my dad's in the, uh, our dad's in the Foreign Service. And, you know, the Foreign Service was sort of like, you know, kind of Ivy League, everybody's Yale and seersucker suit types, right? Like white guys, right? Certainly no women, right? I'm telling you, maybe, maybe one or two. No and women. so, and, the, and it was a, it was a place where if you were a black foreign service officer, you were basically sent to Liberia or Haiti or uh, as, as maybe a couple other places. But essentially, that's where you're going to be sent because there was like none of these postings to, you know, London or anything like that. You never go France. to France. Not, no, that, they would, <laughs> that was a trap, you know. And so you can feel the racism inside the organization uh, that that they had to, to deal with. I know. And they worked through it, you know, the, the the black foreign service officers created the Thursday luncheon group, which was kind of the few of them could get together every Thursday, and, you know, support each other. Um, then there was, um, but, you know, that's what they were coming back to in terms of the, the end. Yeah, because, yeah, because they're, they're freer over, overseas. They, they can perform to their fullest talents overseas, but coming back here, I mean, Jim Crow is going on, <laughs> just all kinds of things are going on over here. So they're restricted over here. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is dad um, and mom, dad grew, uh, grew up with Martin Luther King in Atlanta <laughs> and mom and they, mom went to school with him too, in the sense of college, mom went to Spelman college and dad went to um, Morehouse College, which was considered the Harvard of the South in terms of black people. And so, um, yeah, he would think Harvard would be the place where Ben should go, you know? Um, but the thing, or, or yeah, the thing is that coming back here was restrictive, <laughs> you know, on all kinds of levels. And so the idea of, oh, let's go to, Africa, you know, where independence is blossoming, you know, Nigeria had just become um, independent, I think in 1960, something like that. Um, dad knew Kwame Nkrumah, the, 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 and mom knew him, she danced with him. <laughs> um, you know, it, these are experiences you don't get here. And so it was it was a dichotomy for us because I call it learning the system backwards, right. you know, because you started with freedom and then you got restricted. So <laughs> so yeah, I, I thought it just thought of something that might be fun for you all. So when I was in sixth grade, we had to do scrapbooks, you know, with scrapbook paper and all this stuff. 
and we did them on, um, you know, like Latin American history, the Aztecs, the Incas was one. Then there was one sort of on maps, I think. And we had to do one. This, this is, is at Sidwell. Well. Then we had to do one on Africa. And so I picked South Africa as to be the specific country I had to do sort of a part of it on. So I went to the library at Sidwell and got out, you know, the book where it talked about Table Mountain and the uh, gazelles and Kruger National Park. And I mean, all this, the gold and the diamond mines and all this stuff, right? And so then the last chapter was called this word I'd never heard of, sixth grade apartheid. And I'm like, what's this word? You know, it was like a totem. So I read it and, you know, it's talking in that kind of veiled, euphemistic kind of stuff about apartheid, you know, and I'm sixth grade trying to decipher this, right? I didn't understand. All right. So I fast forward from 83 to 2000, I live in Paris because, you know, I'm, that was my international thing. And I went to the French equivalent of the Council of Foreign Relations had the president of South Africa came to speak, you know, trying to encourage French investment after Mondeo. It was Tabo Mbeki was his name. And he spoke. And so when he finished, I went up to him and said, you know, back in sixth grade, I did a, you know, I told him the whole story I just told you. And I got to the chapter in apartheid, and for the life of me, I couldn't understand. And Tabo Mbeki said, don't worry, we didn't understand either. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like... <laughs> Yeah, but, oh, but, man, I love you. You that 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 that's that brings me when I got to Maryland and everyone in the U.S. was talking about uh, essentially the equivalent of Black Lives Matter for now, but back then uh, they kept talking about racism, and I didn't understand. Well, what is this thing about racism? I don't understand racism. And then it hit me. I said, "Oh, it's colonialism," because I understood colonialism. Yeah from Nigeria, from growing up in Nigeria during the Biafran War, but I, I didn't understand what racism was. And that's how I finally got to connect the dots. Right. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I saw people like um, the woman in Black, in, um, the Black Panthers, not not Angela, but the other one who was married to the, the guy, oh, I forgot his name, but she was a foreign service brat. Oh God, I gotta remember her name. Um, she was a foreign service brat. She had grown up in Ghana. And Kathy I, I can understand Cleaver. Eldridge Kathy Cleaver. Cleaver. Kathy Cleaver. I, I really understood her. I said, yeah, of course. She's she's growing up in Ghana. She sees the independence movement going on in Ghana. And then she's equating that at some fundamental level with freedom in the US. And so, yeah, okay. So she went the Black Panther way. Okay, fine. But I understood that struggle to me they were the same right. struggle and just different countries right. <laughs> and so you know i t i too uh worked with tabo and becky when i worked at the african-american institute and 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 we would have conferences where they would talk about the lead up to essentially the freedom of south africa in terms of mandela so anyway we both went an international route in our own way he went legal i i went God knows how I went eclectic, <laughs> but I work with the UN, and um, and I, I I carry the same values that shape me, and and I've extended that to my daughter. I put her in the UN International School yeah. <laughs> because she I felt like she needed to have that balance. If I put her in a private school in the US, it would be again more whites than blacks feeling inferior, all that kind of crap. And I said, no, I want you to know the world. So that's, you know, that's right. how that and went. <laughs> so we adopted two kids in France. Um, I lived there from 83 to 2000. And so my daughter was uh, from, so she was 12, was living in France and she's French. And my son, uh, till he was 10, lived in France. And he's French and American. They're both French and American. So, uh, so you know, in a sense, it's similar to those first years in Tunisia and Liberia that they had this experience. And then they come to the States and they see this, you know, complex series of weird Americanisms that they have to deal with. Uh, but they have at least a sense uh, of, uh, 
of uh, this is not the only way things happen. You know, this, and that's right. the, that's the powerful right. thing for both of them. This is not the only way. Yes. Um, so. Right. This is not the norm, the necessary right. norm. You know, which is what we've shared with them also just in yeah. the upbringing. I mean, this, this is one way you have to navigate it like any other. I mean, it's, you know, you, you can't understand how deep this American thing is, right? I mean, it, it goes so deep that you don't even conceive of how deep it is, especially the, the slavery well, part of this American thing. It is so deep. Yeah. It's like in your walls of the place you live. You don't even know how deep it is. I I have one example. Ben's roommate at Exeter, his father uh, was the chair of Time Inc. Okay. I I mean, I knew his roommate, but he was my brother's friend. So, you know, as the older sister, you pay attention, you don't pay attention. <laughs> anyway, the point is, I got a job at Fortune Magazine as the first African-American ad salesperson. And it was only then that Ben that Ben said, you know, Andy's father is chair of Time Inc. Well, okay, okay, that's nice. I didn't know that. And so anyway, um, uh, he called a meeting of all the, um, the new minorities that had been hired by Time Inc. to come to New York in this conference room. So I went up knowing, knowing that I, um, knowing that I would meet him. Okay. So I, you know, so we're, he's, he's telling us all about Time Inc. Or whatever. And then I purposely asked a very poignant question that upset the other ones they thought okay she's gonna get fired because she asked that question but i knew what i was doing anyway at the end of it i said to him you know we know somebody in common he said who and i said ben oh my god ben and then he announces to the whole room oh he's my son's best friend you know and they're, the rest of them want to kill me right they want to kill me so any case fast forward so he said come whenever you're in new york come see me you know he stopped by so i would go to his office every once in a while and i unannounced and i would tell his secretary the gatekeeper hi i'm here to see ralph davidson and she'd look at me do you have an appointment no i don't have an appointment but he'll see me anyway and she'd look at me like god she's arrogant you know and then she would go ask him and then 10 minutes later i'm in his office right well one of those times i went to him and i said you know our clients, we go to these country clubs uh, that where Time Inc. has memberships. I said, and so there are five female ad salespersons. We're all of different persuasions, Jewish, um, Latina, Chinese, and so forth. We go there and I told him, I said, yeah, we go there, but we can't play golf with our clients because they don't allow women to play golf. And he's like, and then the racial issues. So anyway, so I was just telling him that. So fast forward, there's a, there's a ad sales global meeting for Fortune. He's the keynote speaker. He brings his other son to this thing. And his other son says to me, as we're walking into the dining hall, my dad says, I want you to sit, sit. I, I need to sit with you. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, I'm not really thinking. And then, then he gets up and gives this speech where he says, as of today, Time Inc. will no longer have memberships in country clubs where there's discrimination of any kind. And that was it, right? Of course, the rest of them were mad at me because they thought I had done something, but I hadn't done anything. I was just casually telling him. I didn't know he was going to do that. So I'm just, you know, affirmative action works in a lot of different ways. To me, that's an example. But that's it. I know you got to go.